And welcome to the Modern Philosophy Podcast. I am your host, Kira Ashley, a.k.a. Ashley Hayes, and I am so excited. Today, we are interviewing someone you've already heard on a previous season, one of my favorite people in the world, one of my favorite collaborators, one of my favorite writers. We have Grip in the building. Let me introduce or reintroduce you. Grip is a pluralistic cyborg system based primarily on the internet. E are prolific creative producers with work ranging from written word to performance art to electronic installation. E are longtime arts organizers, founder of the Construct College of Creator Pedagogy and the short-lived Misanthropy Literary Magazine, as well as an organizing member of several Poetry Slam venues across the state. Ear first book, a collection of short story screenplays titled The Fainting Game and other stories, was released in April 2021 by Game Over Books. The titular story won Best Screenplay at the 2021 Sunnywide Film Festival. The collection also includes Shyla, which won the 2018 Bolt by Barnstorm competition. The film version of Shyla debuted the following year at the 2019 Roxbury International Film Festival, where Grip was awarded awarded the K-Born Emerging Filmmaker Award. Grip's original sitcom pilot, Offbeat But On Point, won the 2020 Table Read My Screenplay competition, was broadcast as a professionally produced table read, and landed Grip in the International Screenwriters Association's 2021 list of screenwriters to watch. As a rapper, he have released six independent studio albums, most recently Eternalist in June 2021, as well as a spate of mixtapes, EPs, and compilations. E won the February 2016 Rap Slam at AS220 in Providence, as well as the MFA Boston Late Night Rap Slam in October of 2017. E holds degrees in computer science from Morehouse College and Georgia Institute of Technology. Much of Grip's work much of Grip's work is fantastical, surreal, and absurdist. It confronts race, gender, mental imbalance, loneliness, existential dread, and emotional disability. In Ear's spare time, he enjoy board games, avoiding attention, and writing biographies in the third person. You can find more of your work at glasseyeballs.com. So welcome to the show, Grip, or welcome back to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's always always. a good time with you. So this episode, we're going to talk about screenwriting. We're going to talk about what happens in that brilliant brain of yours. (laughs) So the first Uh, question... Let me know if you figure that out. (laughs) (laughs) We're we're on a journey. It's a journey for everybody. (laughs) What made you want to write TV? Uh, Sure. Um, So there's actually uh, a couple things. Uh, I was... We we know each other at least first through... uh, Poetry Slam community. Um, so in 2017, I was on my last organized Poetry Slam team um, to this point. But uh, I just kind of felt like sort of done with the form. Um, I'd been writing in that form for like 10 years and we made final stage and I just kind of felt like I understood it and I was kind of looking for like a new venue. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think screenwriting was attractive to me for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, because it's uh, a larger coordinated format with slam poetry. There's like group pieces sometimes, but a lot of it is writing in the first person about myself and delivering it myself uh, and screenwriting kind of because it's, you know, uh, has roots in theater. Um, yeah, it has like a, a little bit larger stage and a little bit more opportunity to like, like, uh, pit perspectives against one another. Mm-hmm. Um, and then TV in particular, um, I like because it's serialized. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that felt to me, I think we've maybe said this literally in the last episode, but it mm-hmm. felt to me a lot like the slam poetry creation mechanic that I was used to, where it was like a group of people who were in a room all writing independently, all with their own projects and their own stories that they were telling, but they had to be cohesive and work together. Um, like we're, we're on poetry slam teams 
um, like a, a, the individual poems were very often like first person I'm talking, mm -hmm. but then the sets, if you're on a team, you have four rounds and I'm not going up every single round. So what I say has to make sense with what other people say, say, and like that kind of like coordination, collaboration has a lot of effect on the meaning of what your team as a whole is saying. Mm -hmm. And that just sounded really similar to me to like being in a writer's room um, and working with different people to say different things around the same theme. Um, I also, uh, I watched at some point the Shonda Rhimes masterclass. Uh -huh. And one of the things she said in it was, uh, you can tell if your idea is an idea for a movie or a TV show because movies have endings. Movies mm. have like a problem and then the problem is resolved. And like TV episodes kind of have that. But TV shows usually have like some central conflict that the characters approach from different angles, but it has to keep generating conflict because there are more episodes. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just really like that serialized medium. Like, I don't know. I, I have thing. learned to like it too. I, I'm a short form <laughs> gal myself. So writing anything beyond three minutes is still very, very new to me. But I think it's dope. And to that end, we now have a TV pilot. What? Yeah. <laughs> so now y'all yeah. know me and Grip have been in the kitchen cooking. So yes. you want to tell the folks about our process, how Do this I? collaboration came to be, why it makes sense. Yeah. Oh, man. So many things. Okay. So um, oh, where to even begin with that? So in 2020... Uh, as stuff was starting to close down for COVID, um, I dropped out of school and I dropped out of an MFA program in screenwriting. And I kind of don't want to talk about that. That's a big bag of worms. But it did mean that I was like suddenly free to do some other stuff. And one of the things I noticed as stuff was like drifting online um, because of COVID was that I felt actually far more prepared to teach online mm -hmm. than the people I was observing in like academia. Um, because they didn't conceptualize anything about their classes or their lives that way. So they were kind of just trying to jam in-person classes onto Zoom, which doesn't really work. Um, so I started uh, a series of workshops um, to try to, you know, experiment with some of this stuff. Um, I'm, I have computer science degrees. So like part of it was just I wanted to try building chatbots and see if I could get the chatbots to participate in the workshops with us and like help us out. <laughs> but so part cool. of it was also like I was trying to evangelize the connection that I'm seeing. Um, between poetry and scripts. Mm -hmm. And not to jump ahead too much, but that's kind of what the book is too, right? It's like the, a short script in particular, um, you know, like a feature length film or even a TV episode kind of has to have a longer arc where beats interact with each other. But a short script in particular can kind of have the same conceit as a poem where it's like you're kind of saying one thing or displaying one image and you're like examining it without like unpacking it entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I... The first couple of workshops I taught were that. They were called the short script as a form poem, which was basically just reducing the idea of a short script to the different elements in it and then encouraging people to write poetry that just used those elements. And given that the elements are constitutive of... The right word? Who knows? Consti the elements construct a short, uh, short script. Writing in this form allow in my head allows you to allow me to transfer the mechanics that I would otherwise use for writing poetry to script writing. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the the main thing with scripts is, and actually, again, to talk about the book, but the first script in the book, the publisher was like, people don't know how to read screenplays or what the, any of this means. So you should like include a, like a primer, include a page that like explains what the parts are. And so mm -hmm. that's kind of what the workshop was, is a script is really just, you can describe a, an image of a thing that's in the room that we see you can have a line of dialogue with a character and that's it now tell a story with only those parts mm -hmm. um and so you know it was, it was a workshop we did some stuff but uh Hayes showed up to i don't remember if it was the first one i taught that class like maybe three times and wrote a short script about uh that was like kind of based on your book um yeah as i recall it based on smoke and i was like i don't know if this is the first chapter of a book i don't know if it could be a pilot i was just like here's this thing yeah. what is it <laughs> yeah and so we started talking about that and like i think that uh, for a long time in slam at least i was really consumed with being the base like mm -hmm. being that i was like was telling somebody it was a really big realization for me in slam when i realized that i didn't have to be the 
the headliner person on the team. Like it was okay. Like it was a team sport, which means that I don't have to be the best person. I just have to win my round consistently. Yep. And so for the last few years I was on, the, I was on slam teams. So it was kind of doing that more. So I just trying to organize and help and produce and plan and strategize and like do my round, but not like, not like aim for the super celebrity. So this kind of feels like that to me is like, I get a chance to like write jokes where like, I don't have to worry about getting myself in the in a place to deliver them. I just have to keep the plot stuff in order. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I responded to your short. We started talking about it. Um, uh, I feel like I just, I was asking you some questions about like the character and who you imagine the character to be. Like the character's kind of you, but it's also everything's fictionalized. So I'm like, it was faster for me to divorce you from the character. I'm <laughs> yeah. like, this person's going to be separate from the human being. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I just like asked you some questions about how you conceptualize it and then like did the pilot writing thing. Um, TV has like really predictable rules, you know, like there's really like, um, like really well tread paths mm -hmm. for how to get stuff to an audience. And especially like now in 2022, when people have a ton of facility with TV and cable and the internet and TikTok and YouTube, and there's a, a lot of media like producing and reinforcing tropes mm -hmm. that makes it like that makes like writing us a uh, balanced pilot kind of predictable. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I we expanded the short into a pilot. I'm really excited about it. I think that there's like a lot of interesting con like I was talking earlier about the way that TV relies on on generative conflict. Mm -hmm. Like every every episode there needs to be something that like feels like the characters they're negotiating something but also it's not the same as a previous episode that you've done and so i feel like we have a lot of that um i don't know if you want to how much of it should i spill <laughs> we can't spill all of it but i can not say this it. like so the 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 show um is created by both of us like i it was my original pilot that was like okay these are the central characters that i want in this story and so grip sort of went through okay these folks stay this person stays, this character stays, but maybe has a different angle, right? So we just literally were in shared documents for a long time. Yeah. But I remember the question from the workshop and the question you kept saying was, what does this character want? And yeah. so I really love just like investigating and seeing how that, because really it's slick. We got like three episodes <laughs> written. Yo, we're talking, I've been honestly, again, not to spill too much, but I've been thinking about the second episode and I realized a thing that is missing. I have to go back and write it. <laughs> I'm yeah, so that, that question, I think, is really central to, like, I mean, writing, right? Like, to fiction yeah. writing in general is, like, what does your character want? What is the conflict? How are they they approaching it? What are the obstacles? But um, the, the, you know, mechanisms of those things are different in screenwriting because primarily scripts are not intended to be read, really. Like, they're intended to be guide documents for the production. Mm -hmm. Um and so a lot of what you have to think about when you're writing them is how that translation is going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I talk a lot about, uh, I imagine this graph of like, um, like uh, I, you kind of imagine the x-axis and the y-axis and up here somewhere is the goal that the character has. Mm -hmm. They want to like make up with their mom. And so they take a step toward that goal and they call their mom and then the world responds and the call goes to voicemail and so they take another step and they go drive to their mom's house mm -hmm. but then it turns out their mom's house is burned down and that's you know and so that back and forth between what actions the character takes and what responses they get to it get from it are like the core of how how on in on tv we yeah. judge a person's character right I, like, I think a lot about how the plot is kind of the character because what actions they take and how they respond to things is what gives us information about um, their, the character and what they want, what their desires are. And Oh my God, I have two more things. Two more things, I promise. They're you on topic. got it. Um, okay, the first one is the this question, like a conflict for a character, what does the character want, was the, one of the first ones I got in any screenwriting classes. I took a like module class through the professional services school at Emerson or something. I don't remember what the school was. It was definitely Emerson. But the first question, one of the first shorts we wrote, the professor gave us the prompt, write a character who has a desire or an objective that is not spoken about explicitly through the first two thirds of it. They just act toward it. And you have to infer it. And the script that came out of that 
prompt was the fainting game was that <laughs> the title story of the ah. of the book. Yeah. Um, um, but then, so I feel like this question, right? Like what are the conflicts the characters are facing was like really central to that early development. And I was like, how do you imagine Hayes? Why are the relationships she's in failing? What is she doing that is having the wrong effect? What is generating that conflict? And then also for the secondary characters, right? Like the, the pilot has an A plot that's on Hayes, but also a B plot that's on the other lead. Yeah. And so who is that person and what do they want and why are they acting for it? And yeah, I think we came up with some really cool parallels. I think so too. <laughs> I like it. I was, I'm always saying like, I spend so much time writing scripts and not, uh, some of them have been produced, but like not most of them. And so primarily this show is just me right now. Like I, I read it and I'm like, I love this show. It's my favorite TV show. All of the jokes are exactly my style. <laughs> uh, that's terrific. Right? That's part of why you want to be in the room. You're like, yeah, yeah it's my favorite. That's why I love producing things. I'm like, I produce mm-hmm. things that I'd watch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't exist. We have to make it. We have to make it. So, we have our work cut out. First of all, we've already done. I, I like I look back on the past year and I'm like, we really have been like taking steps to make this happen. So let's recap the people on what we've done to this point, sort of what that collaboration was like and then where we're at now in the process and what's next. Sure. Uh, uh, so, yeah, the workshops we we're talking about were like uh, mid 2020. Like I was kind of running them at the same time the I was finishing up the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the pilot, I think we had the first draft at the end of 2020. Like, That's I think it was right. maybe finished in January 2021. Um, and then since then, I I mean, I wrote a second episode, but again, I just realized some stuff I need to change about it. I'm like trying to get ahead of it. Right? Yeah. Like, I feel like <laughs> at some point, HBO is going to show up and be like, hey, we actually do want to purchase this show. And shout out HBO. Hey, what's but, up? Uh, Y'all want yeah. the show? Holler. But, uh, I'm trying to get to that at that point, like already be a couple steps ahead. So I don't have to like, we don't have to scramble to do it. But most of what we've been doing is like uh, prepping and planning. Uh, um, Like I made a shoot breakdown. We're like imagining what it would take to cut it together, gathering crew. We just put up casting breakdowns. Um, So it's a lot of that stuff. But to be really honest, for me, it feels like the biggest stumbling block is somebody has to pay for it. You know, like film is a, a really collaborative medium where you need camera people and you need actors and you need people managing the set and you need somebody to do color correction and you need somebody to edit it and somebody to make music. And like, we can do some of that stuff. I can do some of that stuff. I can do much of that stuff even, but it's not practical for me. Even if hypothetically I could do, you and I could do every task. Like, it's not practical for us to do that. Like, that's not how series get made. Maybe one episode. Um, And so that's really where my head is. Is like, I just wish somebody would cut us a check so we can pay all of the creative people (laughs) that we know and work with and need to make the episode happen. But so that's what we we also like, we wrote pitch. That's another thing we did over the last year is like wrote a lot of pitch materials, um, synopsis of the pilot, character breakdowns and imagined budget. Um, So what we're we're saying is we have the bricks. (laughs) Literally. (laughs) We're saying but, is we have it. Yeah, I'm like really a strong believer in that, you know, and like just start doing, to start whatever the thing is that you want to have done, start doing it and hope the, the rest of the world falls in line. It's not even hope, like they'll start falling in line because you're doing it. And I'm kind of feeling that happen now, you know, like we've been applying to these grants and like submitting it places and even doing like a little bit of fundraising on our own. And um, it's like starting to feel like that, like this is... Like, we have all the pieces together. We know exactly what it would take to create the thing. And so it's more really just a matter of resourcing it than than any of the planning. But I really want to think of, you know, like, I want this to be a series. And I want us to shoot 10 episodes a year. And then I want it to spin off into a cinematic universe. And I have delusions of grandeur, but I I think we're on the right track anyway. And me too. (laughs) And that's the thing. It's like, you know, I talk about on this podcast, it's like confidence, right? Confidence in your ability, confidence in the people that you work with, confidence in the work that you're doing. So like you already laid out, it's not like we're like, hey, we have this idea for a show. No, if you were to come to us right now, we have a script, we have a shot breakdown, we know (laughs) exactly who the 
cast tap to be. You know, we know who our dream cast is at this point. And so the more that you do up front of that, it's literally like give us a bag of money and we already know where it's going to go. I think I said that in a few episodes. Like my thing is usually I know exactly where I'll put the money, even if it isn't here. So just write yeah. us a check. So right now we're yeah. fundraising. If you all have any grants that we can <laughs> submit cool. to, send them to us. We're also if just you cash. Know, we'll just take money. If you we'll take that. cash. <laughs> Literally, you can click on anchor.fm slash modern philosophy and support us. You can go to PMG philosophy media group.com and check us out. Like literally, if you're just like, hey, I've got 50 bands laying around. I want to see what show you produce. Call us. We will tell you Literally. exactly. <laughs> exactly. I have a pilot in six months, y'all. But... Yeah, I I heard um I want to say Lena Waithe say that there's like a lot of negotiation about race politic in Hollywood, but honestly the only color anybody cares about is green. Mm. And like I feel like that's that's why this becomes a better value proposition is because it's much easier to be like there's an there's return on your investment at the end of this. Like if you don't have to war- wonder about all of the stuff between handing us the check and getting back the thing you paid for. Yep then it's like a lot easier to be like, and then see, all you would have to do was sell it. it (laughs) Literally, all we got to do is sell it. So holler at us because we are looking for people, but I think that we're going to make this happen. We're on the road. We're getting it bit by bit. Um, But production is no hope. It's it's not necessarily easy. (laughs) Um, What is your dream writing, producing, directing scenario? If somebody was like, yo... Okay. What, oh man, I have a million job? things. Okay, <laughs> so this shifts. This shifts me a lot. Like I'm constantly daydreaming. But I have. I'll tell you the one that I'm like thinking about working on right now, mm-hmm. and then I'll tell you the one that's like my Hollywood fantasy. Um, the thing I'm I'm writing right now is I'm in the middle of a new pilot that is like a futuristic western. It takes place in like ten years, and a lot of infrastructure is broken down, and consequently, it's like kind of back to horses and guns. Um, uh huh. Uh, and so in my head, this is a mini series that's like four seasons of three episodes of 90 minutes each. Oh. Um, so that's like my like feels within arm's reach dream mm-hmm. is like, like writing those 12 episodes. And this is like my mini opus, my, but yeah. my Hollywood dream is, uh, I'm a really big Rian Johnson fan. <laughs> Okay. Um, and so I'm still kind of holding out hope that they're going to let him do a Star Wars trilogy. And then in like Star Wars tradition, the second film in the trilogy is always like kind of the wrench. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah. He did this. He did that for the previous trilogy. Mm-hmm. Like he was the he was the second he wrote the second film and like threw a wrench into it. And so my ho- Hollywood dream is they let him make that trilogy and then I get to write the second film in his trilogy. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. That's lofty. <laughs> I know. That's my like I said, that's my Hollywood fantasy. I don't know if they're they're gonna put me in charge of Star Wars, but I can dream. <laughs> but you can there. dream. I can dream. And I believe you're qualified. So hey, I agree for Star Wars. <laughs> I mean like here's the thing is I think I like I think that there's so much distance between like being able to do it and being entrusted to do it. Mm-hmm. You know? I think you're totally right that I'm capable of it. Like I believe in myself so not to talk about the thing I said I didn't want to talk to, but people were like, while I was getting like pushed out of the MFA program, people said this to me a lot. Like, like, I don't want this to interfere with your thing and you shouldn't have to deal with this. I'm like, but that's not the issue. Like, I know I'm capable. Mm -hmm. I'm aware of myself. I love myself. I love my, like I told you, I read my scripts and I'm like, nobody else ever has to read this. I'm laughing at these jokes. (laughs) Uh But, uh, but there's like a, there's distance between like being capable of doing it and being being, like entrusted to do it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, this is the myth of meritocracy, right? It's like the best people for the job don't always get the job because there's a lot of other stuff in it. And I'm actually really, really personally bad at the other stuff. Like we have a fine working relationship, but yeah. a lot of people find me really hard to work with. And low key, I'm autistic. And so I don't always get it. And like the few times that I've been in rooms with Hollywood people or aspiring Hollywood people or people for whom like the studio system is their worldview, we don't really get along. Mm-hmm. And so irrespective of whether or not I could do the job, write the script, like being able to coordinate with those people and work with those people and even just palette it when they say like what I consider to be really violent or bigoted or untrue things is part of it that I'm not always great at. But that's also a reason why I think Drow is a really great idea because you can do all this stuff. You do all the production and dealing <laughs> yeah. with people. Like just straight script. I'm, very, I'm great with talking to people, you know, I'm, and I yeah. always, you know, it goes back to our previous episode, like, 
taking it into our own hands. Like, yeah, yeah. at some point, you're probably going to have to play ball with the studio, but do what you can and make it so that when you play ball, it's on your rules. And, and that's what I'm yeah. going after, ideally. Yeah, I'm trying to be... I was trying to be Larry David, not to compare, compare myself to a great <laughs> voice but, um, <laughs> but yeah, like I feel like in my head, in my head, the like narrative of Seinfeld in the 90s was Larry was a really good writer, but kind of hard to work with. And Jerry was like a great personality and could deliver these jokes cleanly and made everybody comfortable and made the, sh- the show really marketable and profitable. And so they like put up a little bit with Larry being a cervic in the writer's room. And like, that's in my, in my head. I'm like, I want to do that. I want to go into a Hollywood meeting and get mad and storm out. And then Hayes has to be like, that's just like, that's so <laughs> cool. That's fine. We're going to I might not that. do a weird decision, but. We're just going <laughs> to, that's just them. Yeah. That's just how they are. <laughs> so <laughs> what, what other projects are you working on now? What I love about you is that there's always yeah. like something in tandem. It's never just the screenplay. Mm. So what do you got yeah. in oh, your studio so now? So much stuff. Yeah. Part the reason that that is, is because I said this in the last podcast too, but this is really just high key, not where like the money for my life comes from. Mm-hmm. I have a day job where I program and they don't expect a lot from me, but they pay me pretty well. And so I have a lot of room to, to explore stuff. And so that's why you get that feeling like I'm always working on something different because I, I do a lot of speculative exploratory stuff. Um, so like the Western pilot I'm working on, I'm like 15 pages into it, but I also have like two other pilots that I'm 15 pages into and I just kind of lost interest and put them down. Oh man, I've been freestyling a lot. I like hey. made a bunch of beats and <laughs> been freestyling. Not even the beats I sent to you. I sent you a folder of beats. I have a folder of beats that I need to open. <laughs> have a completely different one. The beats I sent you are like synthy. Like I bought this, I bought this like analog synth on Craigslist. And so I've been using it to like remix some old compositions. But then I also have another folder of beats that's like all samples and like, like, uh, like, yeah, like like turn of the century sampling <laughs> sampled beats. And so I've been freestyling those. Um, I've been building a game, a couple games actually. Um, I have a show in January that I'm hoping to <laughs> that I'm hoping to have like a custom game built for so I can play with the audience. But that's fine. I'm growing weed. <laughs> I'm growing weed, so I just bought clothespins so I can cure the weed. You are um, growing cannabis. This I makes am. me very excited. I'll, I am growing a personal amount in a state where it's legal. A legal amount in a legal state. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> That's exciting. I'm excited about it. It looks really good. I just bought a house, so I have like a lot of like like space and autonomy to explore stuff that excites me. And so that's what I've been doing is just whenever I think about something. I love that. I love that. Um, that could be a whole other episode and like, you know, Working a job, but then doing the creative stuff. I think we talked about, and like, you want to be a poet. It It's always like a balance. Like, sometimes you're going to be full time. Sometimes you're going to be doing other yeah. stuff and sneaking it in. But either way, get it yeah, done. It's really, it's really hard because I, I do feel like, like that having a day job and a stream of income that's not my art takes pressure off of it in a certain way. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I, I worked that, at, yeah. I like, I worked at big tech companies and, and like, like big tech companies that I don't super feel are ethical that I like wouldn't make that choice anymore, but I kind of had capitalism and I need a job and this is how I'm going to sustain myself and blah, blah, blah. And I don't ever have to ask that question of myself about my art. Mm. You know, like, is this gonna, is this, you know, so I've never, like, I think that I've talked to a lot of people who like, I ostensibly have the same goals as, but really want to go to Hollywood and really want to be in somebody's writer's room and really want to be an assistant and really want to work their way up that ladder. And I don't feel that way. Part of the reason I don't feel that way is because that process I did in tech, Mm -hmm. you know, like I did have to placate people and be a sycophant and work my way up the ladder in programming. But because I did it over there, I can like be really pure and ideologically driven with my art. Yeah. Which is like (laughs) another reason I don't get along with Hollywood people, you know, because like they're all there to make money off. It's, two, it's like two sides. Like with me, it, it was this weird transition because I've got this combo now of like putting ethics into a space that does inevitably make me money. And that, that's that been a wild run, but yeah. it's possible. And I like All that right. we're pushing the bounds and making new new rules. What do you have a favorite medium that you create and all these things, the rapids, oh, the beats? On. Favorite? The ah, come on. Give me if you just were if somebody okay, was my like, favorite pick is one. probably rap. Okay. My favorite is probably rap because I've been doing it the longest. 
And because it's like a thing I do when I'm stimming, like I told you, I've been freestyling over these like over these sampled beats. And like I write a lot of rap that doesn't go anywhere. Like I just like do it because it makes me feel good. It's a way to distract myself or like keep my mind. It's like a kind of a puzzle almost. Ah, Um, I do that a lot. Right. Like these these freestyles I've been writing are like I don't even super know that. Like I use them sometimes. Like I've done one or two of them in shows, but Mostly, I just kind of pace around outside, put a beat on, freestyle. <laughs> oh, that's your favorite. But favorite? I don't know. I don't know. Favorite? <laughs> I read so much stuff question. all the time. So much stuff. <laughs> I don't know. And that's funny. I asked that question, but I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I have a favorite either. Yeah, that's what I was going to say to you. I love the podcast, the nonfiction of course, the poems came first, so gun to my head, I'm going to say the poems, but, you know, just anything, anything yeah. that's pen to paper. So let's get into this. Oh, we okay. have The Fainting Game. <laughs> the Fainting Game is a book by Marshall Grip Gilson, and this is a book of screenplays. And I was reading the intro, and they're intended for people to sort of make the movie in their mind or or the script yeah, in their mind. You want to talk a little bit about why you decided to put these out in a book? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think this is related to what we were saying earlier, right? Like, I was... When I, when I first, first started writing screenplays, the first one I wrote was... Well, okay. I've been, like pretending to write screenplays for a long time like the first like script pages i ever wrote were like probably in 2010 but okay, the okay, first time okay. i like actually wrote a, a cohesive story in a screenplay was hand style which is the second one in this book after the the primer story um and that was in 2017 and shortly thereafter i started realizing that my job at that stage in my career was not so much to write anything for a film as it was to convince someone who was reading my script that I was a good writer, which is a different question, right? Because Uh one of those is intended to be translated onto the screen, and one of those is intended for you to read it and judge it that way. Uh Um, And so that's what these scripts are, are closet screenplays that are I more wrote to like approach my facility with scripts and approach my facility with like, imparting a story in that format on page than to be actually produced. Now, that being said, Shiloh was produced, or at least some version of it, not not exactly the version that's in the book. Um, the, the title story, The Fainting Game, was they did a table read of it when it won at SUNY wide. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that like I, part of my like editing process for the book was going back through and like changing the language. There's like kind of a like a cadence that language gets into like in the same way there's like poet voice there's kind yeah. of screenwriting voice <laughs> um and a lot of that is focused on reducing everything to literally exactly what you can see mm-hmm. and thinking about the juxtapositions between the images so like a lot of time times on film like nobody says anything but oh there's actually this principle called the kuleshov effect mm-hmm. which is how the meaning of a shot changes based on what is interspliced with so there's like this really classic experiment where they show Like, just some person, like, looking, like... And then they cut to a birthday cake and then back to the face. Uh And, like, the face looks hungry because they're looking at the birthday cake. But if they cut to the face and then cut to a gun and then cut back to the face, the face is scared, even if it's the same shots, right? Like, Uh what you're what you're interpreting it relative to changes how you interpret the shots. And so a lot of, like, screenwriting language is doing that, is reducing stuff to an image a juxtaposition and an image that give you an impression without saying it exactly. Uh Um, But yeah, I don't know. They're just stories. There are a lot of, they're very weird. They get increasingly weird, by the way. Like the first story in the book is hand style, which is like pretty straightforward. A person does a thing. It's like a little supernatural element in it. Um, And then they get increasingly weird until by the end, it's like a multiverse time travel thing going on. And I don't know how it reads on page. I like it. on brand for you. (laughs) It really is. So do you want to give us a dose of of the weirdness? Because I I love it. Sure. I was going to read the beginning of the title story, the beginning of the fainting game. Okay, cool. It's hard because I have to do characters, but I think that these are... So yeah, the fainting game by Grip. The fainting game and other stories Um, by Grip. Exterior, Micah's house, day. Looks like it might rain. The sky is overcast, the rising sun barely visible. A one-story house sits on a cramped lot. 
chipped paint, wilting bushes. The house might seem abandoned, except that Micah, black boy of 11, opens the front door and descends the steps alone. His thin windbreaker puffs out from underneath the straps of his backpack. The bag is so heavy that he drags his feet as he turns up the sidewalk and continues down the road. Exterior city street day. The street is glum. The sidewalk is cracked. Michael, Micah shuffles behind a, beside a chain-link fence. He reaches his arm out to run his fingers across it, and it rattles. Schoolyard. Behind the, children, behind the school, children of various ages scurry and play around a modest field, a playground, a basketball hoop mounted on a wall. Laughter as Micah approaches the school. Young teenagers stand congregated by the corner of the building. Micah moves closer to watch the commotion. At the center of the circle of students, Ibrahim, brown boy, 14, beckons the crowd like a barker. All right, who's next? Ibrahim scans, scans the crowd. Micah inches closer, timid, still behind the group. He catches glimpses of the action between the bodies in front of him. Come on, don't be chicken shit. A girl stands at the front of the crowd, arms crossed in a heavy bubble goose. This is Latanya, black girl, 14. Ibrahim struts the circle. Latanya catches his eye. You? You in? She nods shyly. Yeah, okay. The crowd hoots and cheers her on. Ibrahim leads her to the center of the circle. You ready? Explain it again. Okay. First, you squat down and breathe real heavy, in and out, like as heavy as you can, 25 times at least. Then stand up real fast, bite down on your thumb, and blow out all the air you got. Then what? That's it. It's dangerous? Nah, it's like if you go underwater, as soon as your body needs air, you come back up. Latanya nods, smiles cautiously. Okay. The crowd eggs her on. Ibrahim steps back. Go ahead. Latanya pauses, then pulls off her coat and tosses it aside. She squats down, crosses her arms on her chest, and starts breathing heavily, sucking in and pushing out quick, shallow breaths. Micah's eyes are wide with wonder. Ibrahim smirks. Latanya ventilates for a few seconds before springing to her feet. She bites down on her thumb and blows out as hard as she can, exhaling. Then her knees buckle underneath her. Again, the crowd erupts, gasping and laughing. Latanya stays on the ground for a moment before struggling back to her feet. She looks around, dazed. Everyone watching clamors in amazement. Ibrahim steps forward to pat the disoriented girl on her back. You good, you good. Yeah, I'm fine. Feels real good, right? Tanya does not answer, but grabs haphazardly at her coat and retakes her place in the crowd. Who next? Who next? Can I try? The crowd falls silent. Everyone looks around. Bodies part to reveal, reveal Micah. Ibrahim looks down on him in disbelief. Word, you want to get in on this? Micah nods as Ibrahim steps closer. What, you in, like, fourth grade? Fifth? Chuckles from the crowd. Micah bows his head. Nah, little guy, it's not for you. Ibrahim reaches forward to shove Micah a little too hard. You should probably just com go comb your one pew. Hmm. Only the boys in the crowd laugh. Ibrahim steps back as Micah slinks away. Come on, somebody real get in here. Micah lumbers to the front door of the school, then turns to look over the yard. A group of girls double dutch. Some younger kids run around a game of tag. Another group of kids obsess over trading cards, pointing and joking. Micah is by himself. Stop there. Oh. If you want to know what happens, gameoverbooks.com. <laughs> you want to know what happens, get the book. Yeah, that's fine. I just, I, I, part of that was very selfish on my part because I love listening to you narrate. Like, <laughs> If the I mic. could just produce a podcast of you like narrating your stories, Yo, let's can I do talk the about that. Actually. You're listening to <laughs> Ashley Hayes, and this is the Modern Philosophy Podcast. Yeah. Whoa. I got to get you to do a drop. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. Much, Grip, much. if people want to book you, if they want a beat, they want a freestyle, they want a screenwriter, how can they find you? They want you uh, to build website. code. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So I deleted all my social media. It was feeling very unhealthy, but uh, my website is still up, glasseyeballs.com. I have a mailing list at zine, Z E E N, zine.glasseyeballs.com. Um, it's linked from the main page. So if you go to glasseyeballs.com, you should see it there. Uh, my email address is also on there. I'm not difficult to reach. Got to know you're looking for me. 
Yep. Look for Glass Eyeballs. Y'all be sure to reach out to Grip. Be sure to get a copy of The Fainting Game and other stories. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. Watch out for Drought 2023. And watch out for Drought 2023. (laughs) That is super important. That's the name of the show. It's going to be called Drought. Um, So y'all be on the lookout for that. Hit us up. Support that work so that we can get this on your screens but thank you so much for tuning into the modern philosophy podcast my name is kira ashley aka ashley hayes and together we are learning better doing better and being better grip i'm gonna put you on the spot give me a song to make the song of the week oh god that is really on the spot uh do (laughs) slr That's the new SLR, Steve Jobs by Lupe Fiasco. Okay, SLR, Steve Jobs by Lupe Fiasco. Y'all, please remember to hydrate, moisturize, mind your business, and wash your hands. And I will see y'all next time.